Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about hypercapnia. Dead space ventilation can be a little bit complicated topic, so we'll dedicate a few lectures to this. We learned from the previous lecture that the PSU2 increases because of increased production, decreased minute ventilation, and increased dead space ventilation. And today we'll be talking about this VD by VT ratio, which is called dead space fraction. Dead space is the part of the tidal volume not participating in gas exchange. In a normal person, the tidal volume of 500 cc, around 150 cc remains in anatomical dead space and around 350 cc goes to the alveoli. The portion that goes to alveoli is called alveolar ventilation where the gas exchange can happen. There may be a part of the alveoli which don't participate in gas exchange and this is called alveolar dead space. In normal human beings, typically no alveolar dead space. Physiological dead space is a combination of anatomical and alveolar dead space and the minute ventilation is the combination of all three. When somebody talks about dead space, they mean physiological dead space. If you have alveolar dead space, for example in this case around 100 cc, it takes away from the normal alveoli. So now your alveolar ventilation is only 250 cc instead of 350 if your tidal volume remains the same. In certain situations, you can have increase in anatomical dead space. For example, if you add something to your breathing circuit, that would again take ventilation away from the normal functioning alveoli. So in this case, the anatomical dead space is now 200 cc instead of 150 and your alveolar ventilation has dropped to 200 cc. Minute ventilation is your tidal volume multiplied by the respiratory rate and the tidal volume consists of dead space and alveolar ventilation. Anatomical dead space is about 1 ml per ideal body weight in pounds. So if you are 150 pounds, your anatomical dead space is around 150 cc. Anatomical dead space increases with age at around 1 cc per year. Anatomical dead space decreases by 30% when you are lying supine. It is around 140 cc if your neck is extended and 70 cc if your neck is flexed. This also depends upon your lung volumes increasing with higher lung volumes and also increasing with bronchodilators and use of PEEP. Anatomical dead space can be a problem because it results in recirculation of carbon dioxide. The last part of the end expiration which is emptying of your alveoli still remains in your anatomical dead space. So this gas is still rich in carbon dioxide and this is inhaled back in during the next inspiration. So around 150 cc of exhaled air that is rich in the carbon dioxide is re-inspired and results in recirculation of carbon dioxide. If you have a larger anatomical dead space, there will be more volume of recirculated air. Anatomical dead space can vary with mechanical ventilation. So when you intubate somebody, you take portion of the anatomical dead space away as the tube is much thinner than the upper airway. So your intubated anatomical dead space after intubation is only 70 ml compared to 150 ml. If you put somebody on a non-invasive, you add the volume of the mask to the dead space and now your anatomical dead space is 200 cc. Intubation, though it decreases the anatomical dead space, However, adding additional part to the circuit, for example, catheter mount connectors usually increases the dead space further as shown in red area and it usually negates the effect of decreased dead space. One other thing to remember in anatomical dead space is as you decrease your tidal volume, your alveolar ventilation drops dramatically. So, for example, if you're breathing at 500 cc, your anatomical dead space is around 150 and your alveolar ventilation is around 350. As your tidal volume drops down, as for example, if your tidal volume is 300, your anatomical dead space ventilation remains the same. However, your alveolar ventilation drops down to 150. If your tidal volume approaches the anatomical dead space, your alveolar ventilation drops down to zero. If you remember, it's the alveolar ventilation that results in CO2 removal. So if you are using patients on low tidal volume ventilation, expect some hypercapnia in these patients. 
And again, just to be clear, lung protective strategy is more important than treating hypercapnia. And if you have issues with hypercapnia, you can use different modalities on the ventilator to help you out. Please see my lecture on optimizing respiratory rate on the mechanical ventilation. If your anatomical dead space increases, so for example, say 200, your tidal volume at 200, your alveolar ventilation will be still zero. So adding any extra connectors to the circuit can increase anatomical dead space and decrease the alveolar ventilation and can cause hypercapnia. Alveolar dead space is mostly caused by decreased perfusion rather than increased ventilation. In patients like pulmonary embolism, microthrombi or inflammation, which causes reduced blood flow to the capillaries, while your ventilation is still persistent, can result in alveolar dead space. In COPD, there is destruction of alveolar walls and decreased elasticity along with obstructive lung disease. This results in alveolar hypoxemia and which further result in hypoxic vasoconstriction resulting in high VQ alveoli or even dead space. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is a very effective way of reducing the blood flow to a non-functioning alveoli. If you have a non-functioning alveoli, the body will divert the blood flow from this alveoli to a normal one by a process called hypoxemic vasoconstriction. And if there is a ventilation in this alveoli still present, this alveoli will now present as a high VQ area or a dead space. So a shunt-like physiology with high perfusion and low ventilation because of hypoxemic vasoconstriction turns into relative high VQ ratio as your Q is much, much smaller than your V. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is stimulated by low alveolar PO2 and low pulmonary artery PO2. Inflammation usually causes more shunting of a problem rather than a dead space, though areas of high VQ can exist in patients with inflammation as well. Clinical conditions causing alveolar dead space include obstructive diseases like COPD, asthma, blockages in endotracheal tracheal tube with secretions, etc. You can have alveolar destruction, for example, the bullet that you see in COPD are dead spaces. Patients with pulmonary embolism and low cardiac output can result in alveolar dead space. In patients with low cardiac output, there is a decreased perfusion to more non-dependent areas of the lungs, which results in high VQ ratios in these areas and possibly some dead space. Patients with ARDS and use of high PEEP can result in alveolar dead space as well. In ARDS, higher degree of alveolar dead space is associated with poor prognosis and this occurs mostly because of VQ mismatch. We can have VQ mismatch in ARDS because of use of high PEEP, injury to the pulmonary capillaries by thrombotic and inflammatory factors, and obstruction of pulmonary blood flow in pulmonary circulation. Bottom line, most of the dead space does not come from real dead space. It comes because of VQ mismatch or VQ heterogeneity and especially with the alveoli with VQ more than 10. It also comes from real dead space and some portion comes from shunts and we'll talk about that in a little while. So how does VQ mismatch cause increased dead space? We know that the P alveolar CO2 is almost equal to the P arterial CO2. So let's make a three alveoli model. We have first alveoli with a high VQ ratio, second with a normal VQ ratio, and a third with low VQ ratio. So the amount of PSU2 coming to the pulmonary vein will be the total CO2 coming from all these three sources shown in green, blue, and red divided by the total volume of the blood flow coming to this area. That is divided by the perfusion that is coming from these three. So you'll get a PCO2 of around 40. And similarly, your PECO2, that's your end expiratory CO2 would be the average sum of the carbon dioxide coming from these three alveoli which is shown in green blue and red part of it also comes from your anatomical dead space which does not have any carbon dioxide and you divide this by the total volume which will be the sum of these four areas so peco2 is 22 and if you remember your dead space formula vd by vt it's equal to the paco2 minus peco2 divided by the PACO2 and you come to the number 43.7%. So 
So despite being there no dead space and just VQMS matches, you see that the dead space fraction is 43.7%. This comes mostly from the areas of high VQ ratio alveoli. Let's see how shunts can cause error in alveolar dead space calculations. Here we have got two alveoli model. We have got an area with a normal VQ ratio and we have got a complete shunt and it's around 50% as your blood flow to this area is two liters per minute, which is half of the total blood flow. If you calculate the PaCO2 coming to the pulmonary vein, you'll see that it is 42.5. And if you look at the PeCO2, it comes out to be 40. In this case, I have disregarded the anatomical dead space because you are focusing on the alveolar dead space specifically. So this VD by VT of 6% in fact is an error during calculation by Enghoff modification because we are assuming that P arterial CO2 is equal to the P alveolar CO2. Whenever you have large shunts, Enghoff modification of your dead space calculation results in some error. If you use the Bose method to calculate the dead space calculation using the P alveolar CO2, you'll figure out that VD by VT is in fact 0%. We'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both method in a subsequent lecture. We know that increased alveolar dead space can cause hypoxemia but responds very well to the supplemental oxygen. You should have observed your COPD patient in the hospital who have hypercapnia but do not require high FiO2. Their SATs are usually well conserved. If you want to know how this happens, see my lecture on hypoxemia from hypoventilation. Does increase alveolar dead space cause hypercapnia? It would appear from the, our equation that the answer should be yes. However, remember anytime you have hypercapnia from dead space ventilation, there should be a compensatory increase in minute ventilation and that should correct your hypercapnia. So possible answer is no. However, you may have observed hypercapnia in your COPD patients. So what's really going on? What is the real answer? We'll talk about that in our next lecture. So in summary, physiological dead space consists of anatomical and alveolar dead spaces. Anatomical dead space results in rebreathing of the carbon dioxide. Increased alveolar dead space takes alveolar ventilation away from the normal alveoli and causes hypercapnia. Increased VQ mismatch, especially alveoli with VQ ratios more than 10, is the commonest reason for increased alveolar dead space ventilation. And very large shunts can cause up to 5% increase in dead space calculations. Thank you.